Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always a good start of the morning. Uh, even, even though we're talking about a very uh, serious uh, subject and a very important uh, subject to be uh, highlighted and discussed by somebody who uh, has gone through so much. And I really appreciate, Michelle, you being here uh, because I think there is uh, so much power in having somebody who, who speaks from experience and there is nothing like that. Uh, Michelle is an author of the Inside Up Close and Personal Profile of Sexual Assault. She's a sexual assault specialist. Awesome. Uh, that's a beautiful uh, that you've got the book there. And I'll add the details as well for people to you know, get in touch and get the book. But we'll talk about that in a minute. And she is a registered coach. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, Michelle. How are you today? Oh, look, it's lovely, Angelica. I love being here. And talking to people, uh, because I think that um, every time we have this conversation, it means that we, we're, we're moving towards something different to what we've got. And it's important yeah. to have this conversation, but it's important to have it in the right way. And unfortunately, we have historically had it in the incorrect way. And it's disempowered um, prospective victims, victims, and empowered predators and so we're going to have a good discussion and yes. maybe do some empowerment of you know the general public as opposed to the predators and I'll explain what that means as we go through. Yeah and what I love about you is that uh, I met Michelle in a networking event and she got up there to talk about uh, you know the, the book but I did not know anything about her and I kind of felt like, oh, my God, I really need to talk to this lady because she's got like a beautiful energy around that. I did not know anything about the book in itself because you didn't actually, you know, talk in detail what it was about. And then we kind of got chatting and we still didn't catch up as much as we would like. I would like. Yes, it's hard, isn't it? In the, in the networking day, environment. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but it, it was yeah. so good that um, I looked you up and, and I thought, you know what, I think this is going to be a really important discussion uh, because, as you said, I think there is a lot of misconceptions around that. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I think it's going to be good for you to clarify some of those. Uh, and I would like to start by, you know, I read uh, yesterday on one of your websites that, you know, when you talk about yourself, you said, you know, the first reaction as a victim you put up walls and never, and, and you think, I'm never going to be a victim again, but this imprisoned you. Um, so I just want you to elaborate a little bit around that, uh, because I think that it's so easy for us to, you know, to think to ourselves, I'm going to make it go away by pretending that <laughs> I am not a victim of whatever it is, and it's going to go, you know, disappear. But tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about something you just said. Um, I wear being a survivor or victim of sexual assault as a badge of honour. I'm a pretty amazing person because I lived through something quite absolutely horrific many, <laughs> many times over in actual fact. But it, it doesn't have to be ten times. It can be just once. Yes. To live through that, yeah, coming from a space where we have no understanding or educational resources to deal with it, that is a really hard thing to do. And I congratulate anyone and everyone who still work, walks this earth who has been through that because yeah. I know how hard it is sometimes to get up in the morning and to sit in a crowd of people and listen to some of the things that come out of their mouths and how wrong and incorrect it is but how dangerous it is and how that trigger is so hard mm. to live with in that space and in that time we are pretty amazing people something that we did not ask to have happen that was completely outside of our control there was nothing at any moment in time that we could have done differently to stop it there's nothing to do with us we didn't plan it we didn't intend mm. for it yeah for us to live through it that's amazing and i i just congratulate everybody right yes we forget to congratulate ourselves that we we live through that and that's yeah. amazing in itself 
Yeah, so it is. Uh, it, it's, I think it's important to focus on the fact that there is no shame in being so brave. I know. Right? None whatsoever. That's something to celebrate, right? I mean, yes. Do it. it is. I say to my clients, I want you to go out and have a cup of coffee or, you know, a nice wine, something, you, you know, is a treat. And I want you to just take a moment to go, yay, me, yes. you know, and have a little drink and, yeah. Because yeah. it's important that we realise just how extraordinary we are because we are. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I know, and, and I want everyone else who's a member of my tribe to know that they're extraordinary. Yeah. So I'd like to start with a little bit of history to answer your question. Yeah. So I've been sexually assaulted a lot. It started at the age of five. Mm -hmm. And I knew that what happened to me was not okay. Yeah. It was a family member. Yeah. And I told my mother <laughs> and I told my grandmother um, and I got shut down. Yeah. And that was really upsetting and confusing for me. And I was really angry about that. I was yeah. very angry about that um, because I guess I was lucky. A lot of, a lot of childhood um, victims sometimes shut it out or they don't realise it's not okay. But it it was I was lucky in that I did, and mm -hmm. I I um so I, all my relationships were dramatically affected by that, and that does happen mm -hmm. to us. Our, the relationships become yeah. dramatically affected, and you put up this wall. Right, you've hurt me. You've you, what's happened is bad enough. The response is even worse <laughs> because it yeah. compounds that trauma. So you put up this wall. And so you disconnect from people um, because because they've hurt you or they've yeah. said something that you know isn't correct. And so you put up this wall and you're just slowly disconnecting from the world and it's a very lonely place to be. Yes. Right? Yeah. And 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 it's really hard to, to, to be able to find a way forward out of trauma mm. when you have disconnected, right? So then I was eight years old asleep in my bed. And I woke up and found the stranger and he had a finger in a place he should not have it. Mm. And he was doing other things that he should not do to an eight-year-old child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. Now, the police were called to this incident and I told, I remember telling the policeman, yes, I want to go up to, into court and tell everyone what he did because it wasn't okay. Yeah. And then nothing, 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 nothing. And I kept asking, and in the end, my mother just told me, stop making things up. You're a oh. liar. It didn't happen. And when I was 14, we had this huge, huge fight, huge. Yeah. I reduced my mother to tears because yeah. I was so angry and in so much pain and so felt so betrayed. You know, I've got all these walls up and I'm not communicating with the outside world. And and everything is about the world doing something to me. And I yeah. and, and I had this huge fight. And she said the police told her to tell me that it didn't happen and I would forget it. <gasps> I am here to tell anyone and everyone there is never a moment in your, in your life that you will entirely forget. I have spoken to victims who were assaulted in childhood and it kind of mm -hmm. went to the back. And something has triggered them at different, you know, different people at different times in their yes. life and their life has yeah. fallen apart. And they have struggled yeah. to make sense of why they're feeling the way they are. And they've had to reconfront mm. everything. Yeah. And then they look at their lives, and many people have said this to me. I look back at my life and I realize that this has destroyed my life. Now, this is people who might mm -hmm. be financially secure, but they've had no real friendships. Mm -hmm. They don't know happiness. They don't know what it feels like. They've had children, mm -hmm. but they don't know the full extent mm -hmm. of that love. And they've confided that in me and they feel guilty about this. But it's not their fault. Hmm. And the thing you is, like what you said, the disconnect. You do. I think you do. It, and it, the disconnection, it, it's also the body disconnection, isn't it? You can't 
well, you, you feel disconnected. You still feel the triggers. Isn't it, like? The triggers are the thing. And, you know, I, I then went on to be sexually assaulted a number of other times. And, um, yeah, you, you do. You, you, the triggers are the thing, and they become more and more prevalent. I guess I had a lot mm -hmm. of sexual assaults, um, 17, 18, you know, 21. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, you, you do. The triggers become all powerful, and you're afraid of them. And so you try to hide from them. You know, and there's different, you, you, you try to cope. You do the best you can. You've disconnected from the world. Mm -hmm. They're not have, to be honest, most people are very unhelpful to victims. I know that's mm -hmm. a really sad, mean thing to say. They don't want to yeah. be. I understand they don't want to be. But they actually mm -hmm. do more harm than good because they don't understand it. Right? Mm -hmm. And now I've been lucky. I walked in when I was 17 on a pack rape about to start with a friend of mine and I was really lucky because I knew everybody there. Some of them I didn't know very well, but I was able to then go and talk to them all afterwards. I stayed, obviously. Mm -hmm. She was off her face. She'd been drugged. Magic mushrooms way back then. That was the, the roofie of the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I stayed and, and yeah. nothing happened, but I got to speak to those 15 men, some of them fathers with daughters and sons, little children, and I got to talk to them and I learned so much about the fact that they had been manipulated and sold something that wasn't real. And, and mm -hmm. they thanked me. Well, the the sexual predator that had worked so hard to create this and draw these men in and create the situation, he wasn't very yes. happy with me. <laughs> yes. But the, the men that I had saved from doing something that they were ashamed of, mm -hmm. they were grateful. And they realised that they would suck, they'd been sold something over a period of time. And so the yes. grooming of not only the victim, which we talk about a little bit, but we don't talk about the grooming of society by sexual predators, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So when we're putting up these walls, because all these people around us are saying these things. I remember my father saying, anyone touch my kid, I'll kill them, right? Yeah. Well, when someone touched his kid, he didn't do anything. Yeah. You know, and he got two shots at it. <laughs> it's five and eight. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, but and it's like you tell me if anyone does this to you, oh, we're shutting the gate after the horse is bolted. And when you hear that yeah. as a victim, that triggers you, takes you to a place that is very dark and you're very angry with society. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole range of things that you can hear. And it just continues to put up the walls and disconnects you and you become exceedingly lonely. And what that does mm -hmm. is it means that you're vulnerable and mm -hmm. predators hunt vulnerable. And mm. so many of us go from being sexually assaulted into domestic violence situations or situations mm -hmm. where we're taken for granted in the workplace um, and abused, sadly. Mm -hmm. These courageous, yeah. wonderful people, and we walked on and treated like a doormat. And um, we're powerless to do anything about it because we're living in this isolated, triggered place, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And I was very, mm -hmm. very lucky. I, I, I ended up, um, if, you know, we talk about, you know, how do we cope with this? So my drug of choice was bulimia. I found that to be the most effective way of shutting down a trigger. It gave me yeah, instant, it's insane, instant it? I release. And I, I watch these movies, you know, and here are the actresses putting their fingers down their throats and I sort of sit there and laugh and think, oh, you amateurs, real <laughs> bulimics don't put their fingers down their throats. Wow. They don't need to. <laughs> they can oh vomit. They can decide to do it and do it. 
right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's crazy. You don't need to put things on your throat to be a believer. Yeah. So um, I found that to be the most useful way of, of stopping the triggers and pushing them to the back. Um, and I had to make a decision when I was 21. Was I going to live or was I going to die? And I thought about suicide pretty much every day, all day. Mm-hmm. I just didn't think it was fair that I was the one that should die when I wasn't the one that had done it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, I just didn't yes. think that was right. So yeah. I got on an aeroplane and I flew away. I'd never been on an aeroplane before. And I yeah. flew to a foreign country all on my own to start again. And um, I was sexually assaulted again. I'll get to that. But before that happened, I I was very, very unlucky in that, like a lot of victims of sexual assault, um, you know, I was taken advantage of in the workplace. I was overworked and I ended up with these massive injuries. And I was sent to this hideous doctor who... Um, I, luckily, I was forewarned. It's another story. It's in my book. Yeah. Um, but he sexually assaults sexual, uh, you know, victims, of work, work injury people. Uh-huh. He sexually assaults them. And in his, when he's giving them a medical, he sexually assaults them, and I'd been warned. And so I was prepared for him. And when he went to put his penis in my mouth, I told him, I know what you do. You stick that in my mouth and I bite it off. And... <laughs> You know, he subsequently threw me out of his office, um, screaming and yelling at me in front of all this waiting room full of people. (laughs) So out I went. And I was followed home by this insurance investigator. And so I remember sitting on the floor, crying, hiding. I didn't want to go near the window. (laughs) Yeah. And I thought, I don't want this. And I heard this little voice and it said, what do you want? And I I didn't know. And when I really yeah. thought about it, what I wanted was to be happy. I wanted to feel yeah. that thing that I watched other people experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that led me to finding a path, meeting somebody and us doing work. We'd both been studying a lot, doing a lot of independent reading ourselves on how to get through trauma and Mm -hmm. we found a a pathway to a place where I didn't have triggers anymore Mm -hmm. where I was at peace and I could feel and I could be this person now I'm I will never be the person that I could have been if I'd never been sexually assaulted exactly yeah yeah I am somebody who who has been I respond mm-hmm. differently to things, you know, than what perhaps people who um, haven't yeah. got to where I am. Perhaps I'm not as afraid of things. But here's the thing. I was sexually assaulted again by my girlfriend's husband. I woke up and, mm. and, and I'd slept over. I was in their young son's bedroom in a separate bed, but in the same bedroom with their young son of four years of age. And the father raped me with his son in that bedroom and his wife asleep in another bedroom. And we went to court and I I set a legal precedent while we were there. But the interesting thing about it is that the DPP, so that's the Crown Prosecutor in Sydney that was running the case that I was a witness for, said to me, my God, I've learned so much from you. And it's really sad I'm about to retire and I didn't know so much that if I knew know what I know now, how things could be so different, how I would do things differently, how I, better mm-hmm. un- I understand better victims. And I, yeah, so um, he understood the situation better. Yeah, so then I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's happened again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> But I was determined that I was going to get to court and that I was going to find that place that I was in. But this time, that place that I was in um, where, you know, it wouldn't happen again. But then I realised something. 
And this is really important. So I want everybody to really understand this. You can't read someone else's mind. Mm. You don't know what they're thinking. So you can never stop it before it happens in a way, but you can, and I'll explain that, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what they're planning. You don't know what they're thinking. They're completely outside of your control. You, you can control mm -hmm. how you respond to the situations that you find yourself in. Mm. And that can change everything, and I'll explain that, mm. right? So firstly, I educated my children, so parents, listen up. We play a big role, or we don't at the moment, mm. but we can. So mm -hmm. my daughter at the age of eight was having a sleepover. The parents broke the golden rule. They were never allowed to leave the house or leave my daughter alone without an adult being there. They both went out to mm. walk the dog. Now, the teenage son was having issues with his younger sister. And this happens a lot in families. It does. And I know it's hard to swallow this pill, but sibling sexual assault is a big problem. Right? Mm -hmm. And he came in and told the girls when they got out of the bath that they had to, you know, show them his bits now I'd educated my children age appropriate from when they were very 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 little so my daughter did exactly what she'd been taught she said okay but I want to finish getting dry so you can go out and when we're ready we'll call you and he went out and she shut the door and pushed the cupboard in front of it she's mm -hmm. only eight and then he couldn't get in and he's banging on the door and he's screaming and yelling and it, the, the sister's crying, her friend, let him in or he'll hurt us. And she didn't let, no, the parents came home, he went to his room. She came, she said, I have to ring mum now, it's time. She gave me a word, we had a code word. Mm -hmm. And I went straight around and picked her up and she was able to verbalise everything that had happened simply because I'd mm -hmm. given her the ability, the resources to do that. But yeah. age appropriately at the right time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So we can't we can't not let our children have sleepovers because um, we're afraid yeah. something will happen to them. How does that help them? It doesn't because when they're thirty one, no. someone breaks, someone rapes them. They don't have anything that you've taught them along the way to help them. Yeah. Right. You can yeah. never ever read someone else's mind or control their behaviour. You have to have That's, a, a yeah. skill set. To deal with them if it happens. And so That's my, really my daughter was but, um, uh, in year 10 at school. Yeah. She was on a train. There was a fellow classmate there that was, you know, nearby, like kind of on the periphery of the group, but not super in the group. And he just touched her. And she turned around and she smacked his hand and she said, don't you ever do that to me again. Yeah. I, you know, how dare you, you're disgusting. And she read him the right act on the train. And he, he smiled and he said to her, wow, you're the first person yeah. who's, who knows what it is I'm actually really doing. Yeah, that's crazy. So he was grooming her to sexually assault her. Yeah. And she was the first person to even know that. Now, it was a few weeks later, she was sitting with her friends, chatting to one, and she looked over and he was sitting next to her friend sexually assaulting her friend in the yeah. playground during break. She ripped a strip off and sent him running. Yeah. And her friend got really upset and she said to her friend, she said to him, because it was a boy, she said, why are you so upset? And he said, he's been doing that to me for months and oh. I couldn't stop him, but you could. So what's wrong with me? And yeah. she said, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. I've been taught and you haven't. Yeah. Right? And what, do you think, what do you think is the difference between, you know, of course, uh, the victims that have been sexually abused as a kid, like, you know, two, three, four years old, yep. and and ladies or, or, or even, uh, you know, a man or, you know, young boys that um, have been sexually abused at age, like I say, the 21, 20. You know, and you talked about the 
you know, the the people that are grooming around, you know, it's not only the person, the predator, but also the, the people that they groom. Yes. And yes. there was there was, for example, a, a Netflix documentary about a a very famous yoga teacher, and you probably know this story, the Bikram, the hot yoga. And you know, he would have people going to this, you know, massive events and and he will be grooming uh, those because he was yes. so powerful. Yes, you know, the people because just they thought and, of him as a guru. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go and, go and, yeah. Exactly, go and get that girl. And yep. the victims, when they were talking about, you know, they are sexually abused by him, they were just normal American at the time girls uh, that they were in their, you know, 17, 18, 20. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that was just incredible because, you know, it wasn't like that they said, oh, you know, this happened to me. You know, it was like, you know, I did not know this was coming. I did not know. No, that you can never read someone's mind. So you have to have the resources to deal with the situation yeah. when you're confronted with it. We're really lucky that we're born with anger, sadness, fear, hurt, and guilt. They're our best friends. Because that anger lets us know when someone, ourselves or someone else has stepped over a boundary and we need to take immediate action, mm. but we don't. Because we've been socially, you know, conformed to yeah. not, you know, you don't have to respond in an angry way, but anger lets us know that something's yeah. not okay and we need to pay attention. And then we need to let that emotion go. But we yeah. don't. And we hold on to it. And then yeah. that, that's another story. Sadness lets us know that something needs to change. That's yeah. where, why we end up with post, with, with deep depression because we don't change a thing yes. that needs to be changed. Yeah. Right? Fear lets us know, get out of Dodge right now. I don't care how yeah. well you know someone, get out. If you feel afraid or uncomfortable, yeah. then you're telling yourself that on an instinctive yeah. level that you're not picking up on consciously, you're not safe, right? Yeah. And the same with um, guilt that we know we've done something that we perhaps shouldn't do again and let's acknowledge it and move on. And hurt is our teacher. Okay, we lift ourselves open, right? If we use these emotions correctly, they can really, really help yeah. us. They can be a resource. But we don't teach our children. So whether we're 5 or 21 or 31 or however old we are, um, if, we, if we use those five emotions correctly, they will help mm -hmm. us. And then we also need to have some strategies. So I taught my children these emotions and what they meant and to let me know if they feel sad. Let me know if they feel yeah. afraid of something. Let me know straight away. I told them, the, the, the broken people, I called them broken people, um, might tell you not to tell me or they might hurt me, but they won't hurt me. I know of broken yeah. people, so I know how to talk to them in their language. So it's okay for you to tell me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took that away. I took all that away. So my children felt comfortable to tell me, and we always, you know, talked. I gave them different things, and, and there is a process. Um, but yeah. here's, the, here's the, the, the final part of my story, which answers your question. So I moved to the Philippines in 2010 for my husband's yeah. work. And went into a toilet at a, at a Halloween party and somebody forced the door. Now, I just sat down on the toilet. <laughs> my knickers were around my ankles. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't kung fuing anyone, right? <laughs> yeah. Forced the door open, came in, and I'd been yelling, there's someone in here, there's someone in here, stop, stop, you know. And they came and proceeded to make it very clear that they were going to rape me. Mm -hmm. So I, so because of the way in which I have the resources that I have, right, given to myself, I immediately thought, mm, what's the best outcome here? I can't fight this man off. He's stronger than me. He's a man. Mm. So what can I do? Yeah. So I, and I remember thinking it, but in a split second, I can get the soap dispenser and, and smash the mirror. I can do that, right? Mm -hmm. I can pick it up and hiff it. And then the other thing I might be able to do is grab the towel rail, and if we're wrestling, I might be able to pull it off the wall. So I said to him, okay, I accept that you're here to rape me. Okay. But here's the thing. 
I want you to know that there's going to be evidence that I didn't want this. And I'm going to tell people what you did. I'm going to report. Yeah. So if if you're going to do it, well, let's have at it, you know, because I really wanted to go to the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was very calm. But then that's because I was in that place, because of the work that I'd done. Yeah. I was in that place yeah, yeah, yeah. where I, I could be that calm. And I accepted mm-hmm. the situation for what it was. And I, I, I knew what I could do to help myself. Right. And I accepted mm-hmm. that that was all I could do. Because what else can I do? Anyway, he couldn't, so what he couldn't rape me. Of course he could not rape yeah, me course. because he didn't want to get caught. And he'd never come across anyone like me before. No. But here's the yeah. thing. When I came to go a few years later, I was in the middle of a lake in a canoe with a lady about my age and her little friend group, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd known them and everything. and she, But they'd never kind of... You know, we'd never been close. And she said, I'm really sorry that we didn't spend more time together. You know, and I said, mm-hmm. yeah, that would have been nice considering our friends were friends. But, you know, why not? And she said, oh, because one of the ladies in the group, her husband had a higher position to my husband and he didn't mm-hmm. think it was acceptable for her to socialise with me. And I burst out oh. laughing and I said, that's not true. He tried to rape me, <laughs> but he couldn't. So I said, and she went white as a ghost, and I knew. He had been raping these women, a group of five women, for two years. They were in their late 40s to 50s, and they had no way, like my my daughter's friend, who was in year 10, no way of protecting themselves from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So it doesn't matter what age you are. Yes. If you don't have the resources, they have all the control. Yeah. You yeah. Need the so when you talk about when you talk that's about what the I've guilt, given you <laughs> the verse. Yeah. So when you talk about the the guilt, like uh, you know, especially the, in the shame, a lot of the young uh, children they carry that throughout life, and of yeah. course, you know, very bad, not just age. So how how do you? Um, you know, what is the one thing that you can say to somebody who is watching this and perhaps they have never spoken to anyone about it, you know, because it was a, a close family member, you know, they, you know, you also mentioned at the beginning, you know, there was nothing you could have done. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I have worked with people that told me, I remember I was in nappies mm-hmm. and I wish I could have done any, something. And I'm like, but how? You were, you were in nappies. Okay, so there's some, like, something that they can do. Mm-hmm. Okay, they can accept that. That um, that they're special, and that that was that per, what that person that person is a broken person, and that they are not responsible for that person. They cannot control that person, and that person that's their problem. And by saying, "Okay, that's their problem. Nothing to do with me. Not my business." Right. It doesn't mean anything about me. It doesn't say I'm a I'm a bad person. It doesn't say that I deserved it. It doesn't say that I'm powerless to stop it. No. It doesn't say any of those things about me. Mm. Right? What it says is that that person and all the adults around them, mm. they got a problem. Yeah. But I don't. Yeah. And that's really important to understand, and it changes every, everyone that I've worked with. That and um, when when they understand that, it changes everything. I remember I was working with a lady, and she said, "I don't know what you did." We sat down, and I don't know. You said a few things, and I went to sleep, and I woke up, and my life is different. I sleep. I don't have triggers. I'm calm. I'm so yeah. peaceful. I laugh and I really feel it. And like, you know, and, and one of the keys to it was understanding that her father was bro- had a problem. Mm. Right? He had an issue that he did, had not dealt with and so then he acted on it. 
Yes. Right? Yeah. You know, she's not responsible for that. Yeah. Like when I was trapped on on the extended relative's knee while he was doing what he was doing. Mm. There were adults around. What I know. Yeah. Right? Now they hadn't been, my mother had been told right from when she was very young and my grandmother told it to me. There are some things you don't talk about and this is one of them. Yeah. End of story. So when I told my mother, she's not talking about that because no. she believed you didn't, right? Um, does that mean she's bad? No, it means she's got limitations. Yeah. And I can't rely on her in this instance. I can rely yeah. on her in a lot of others, but just not this one. Yeah. And that's okay because none of us are perfect. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So in accepting that this this other person's problem mm. has nothing to do with us and it doesn't mean anything, right, it, it, it changes things. It means that we're free to give ourselves resources. I remember yeah. I used to joke this many, many years ago. I used to sit, sit, you know, be joking, say, well, I must have this big neon light flashing that says, oh, <laughs> you know, come and rape me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and in a way I did because the walls yes. left me vulnerable and predators yes. hunt vulnerable. Sexual predators, domestic violence predators. Yes. Yeah. People who want to rip you off some way or another. Yeah. Counselors who need to rescue people. They'll never let you get past it because they need you to fulfill their self-worth. Yes. Right? We're never taught as victims that um, we have a right to expect an outcome that we can we can challenge things, that it's got nothing to do with us. We're not the broken piece. They mm. are. And so are all those other people that saw it and didn't take an action. My cousin, I, it's in the book, She, we were talking one day and she said, oh, you know, mum said we, we used to have all these big family gatherings and her, her and my aunt had said to her, go outside and play with the other kids. What are you doing inside? You yeah. know, such and such is out there. He's watching everyone. Off you go. Well, she said she looked out the mirror, she, no, not the mirror, the window, and she could see what her, her mother could not. And that mm. is the extended relative had this little boy on his knee with his hands down his pants. Yeah. Right? It... It didn't compute in her mind, the mother, but it did with my cousin because she was a little kid. So she hid on behind the sofa for the whole day. <laughs> no, I'm not going there, yeah. Right? Um, yeah, because I, she knew. I used to have to hide from him because I couldn't get anyone to stop him and I didn't want to yeah. end up that way again. So I would have to hide from him. It was really terrorising Yeah, yeah. yeah when I was little. But, but here's the thing. Um, we that's not my fault that I had to hide from him. It was the it was the fact that other people didn't have the resources mm. to deal with him. And so I kept myself safe the best way I could. She yeah. kept herself safe the best way she could. That yeah. that client of yours who was in nappies. Yeah. She couldn't yeah, do I anything. I know. I know. But except not take it on because it's not her problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So talk about it and learn about sexual assault and understand it and understand that now that she's a little bit older, she can develop the resources to make sure it doesn't happen again. Yes. Yeah. Or that she have some way of responding like I did in that toilet. That is doable. Exactly. Anyone yes. and everyone to yes. shut a predator down. But these five emotions that I was talking about. Yeah. They're our early warning system. Yes. And so we might not pick up on it, but if we get a feeling, we need to really be listening to it and remove ourselves or be paying attention. Yes. In, yes. in the book, I talk about um, the categories that I've put sexual predators into, and it's classic, those you don't know. The garden variety, which are the majority, and they are people that are in your immediate circle or on the periphery. And there's mm -hmm. often a lot that are on your periphery. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, it's not our fault. It's yeah. never, ever our fault. We never said or did anything. That little, that, that, that person when they were in nappies, they were vulnerable. Their parents didn't yeah. take good care of them. Yeah. That's, that's on their parents, not on her. I know. Right? And, and you know, it's, it's, when you talk about your stories, it, it, it's almost like you could make a movie out of it, right? Because there's so many occasions. And <laughs> so I many rapes, I know, right? I know. And, and, but also, it, is that it's hard to believe that, you know, it's even possible because you think like, oh my God, I don't know how that happened. But I think you're so right in saying like when you, you know, it happened to you, especially at an early age, you become more and more vulnerable. You do. And, you know, the tendency is, is just that you kind of not manifest, but like, you know, getting yourself into those situations more and more until you actually do something about it, right? Until you actually make and that decision. The problem. And there's where we have the difficulty. Yeah. And for... <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a problem, but unfortunately, a lot of therapies are ineffective with trauma mm -hmm. because they require you to be at war with yourself. Does that make sense? So um, I have a degree, right? So I've, I've, I've studied, yeah. yeah. I don't use the mm -hmm. typical process. I didn't use it for myself. I don't use it with my clients because I want results right and and that's what we get um but when 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 a therapist has to rely on what a client tells them to be the truth you immediately have a fundamental breakdown because it is such a horrific thing if you have no context when it happens and we have no context because we don't teach it correctly um that it's hard to admit things to even ourselves. So we can't tell it to someone else. How can we? How can we tell someone something that is so horrific that we can't even bear to think about it ourselves? We can't. And so it's like a weed. We can cut it off at the top, but we can't pull the root out. Right? It's always going to grow back because we can't even look at it. And so it means that it's really hard for us to fight against ourselves. So the counsellor may say, okay, so maybe in that situation or when you feel that, you could do something different. When something is so entrenched and it is encased in anger and fear, it is really hard to fight it. And it's like you're, you're at war with yourself. You're trying to fight against something that inside you, you want to run like hell away from that thing. And you can't relax. You can't be calm. And so it means that you're at struggle with yourself and it's exhausting and it creates huge anxiety. Just the thought of going to the next session can, can, can bring on huge anxiety. And so that, that, that type of approach doesn't necessarily always work. And so it's important for us as these incredibly brave, courageous people to know we have the right to say, okay, the approach that you're using is not working for me. And I love that therapists, they always say, ah, oh, they're just not responding. Not my fault. <laughs> we need to say, okay, wait, the way in which you're approaching things isn't helping. What else can you offer me, right? What else is out there that you can find for me? And so then, you know, it's important that we have an expectation, not hope. If you go on Google and start looking, you'll see a lot of emphasis on giving victims of sexual assault hope that in the future they're going to feel a little better. And that's cruel and unkind. Because we deserve results. We, we are so brave that we deserve better than you, you are not responding and hope. We deserve better than that, right? I really believe that. And I think that if a therapist is fine, and this is where we get therapy burnout, because therapists know they're not achieving anything and they burn out. And it's sad because they're, they're, 
a lot of them, yes. their deep intention is to help you the best they can. And maybe the best way they can help you is to bring someone in to do some sessions that does get results and for them to monitor. Maybe that's a way forward. Now, if you're out there and you want you want some help and you don't want to have to talk about it, that's fine. I don't need you to. I can help you without you telling me your story. Yeah. And if you've got a counsellor and you're not sure it's working, you know what? Keep my number because I'm happy to be your plan B. Mm. You know, it's important to have a plan B and I'm happy to be there. Yeah. yeah. And if you're going to court, yes, then reach out because I do work with people to help them to have a bit of equity in the court process. I walk, worked with a young girl during lockdown in America. Yes. And when she got up on the stand and gave evidence she said everyone in the room was in tears michelle except me and i only had a tear when i talked about the damage that he'd done to my body mm. but she said i walked out of there and i have never felt more empowered yes and more proud of myself in my entire life and you know whether you she got a very positive outcome but whether you get a guilty or, or an un, not guilty is irrelevant Yes. It's the way in which you walk out of there. Yes. And if yeah. you have represented yourself and you are proud mm. of how you represented yourself, then yeah. that's all you can ask. Because you know, that that jury, they might all be rapists. You don't know. You don't know who those people are. They're outside of your control. The gift that yes. you can give yourself is to stand up and say, hey. What that person did to me was not okay and I'm holding you accountable. It's yes. now on you, jury and judge, whether he goes out and does it to someone else. But yes. I've done my part and I've self-respected and that's the gift I gave myself and I'm proud of me, right? Yeah, that's and amazing. That's really, really important. Yeah. So one last question, Michelle. If you've got somebody who is listening to this and they have never spoken about their sexual abuse because they're too scared they are living in that same prison as you described you know on your yep. website you know like i'm 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 i've got yeah. some walls around me i don't know how i don't know if i can do it i'm too scared it was a family member it was somebody close to me i'm full of yep. guilt and shame i yep. you know what what do you have to say to that person that it's okay to feel that way and the reason you feel that way, and I've, I've been there for a very long time, nearly mm. half my life. And, and the reason is that you just didn't get taught the resources. And I'm happy to talk yeah. about those resources. I can help without you having to talk about it until you're ready to look at it for your own self. And then, you know, go from there. However that looks for you, you don't have to do what I'm doing and sit on a podcast and tell the world. That's okay. That's exactly. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. It can look like whatever it needs to look like yes. for you. Exactly. Because it's your gift to you that mm. you allow the walls to come down and learn how to set boundaries. The greatest freedom that we will ever feel is our ability to lay down a boundary when someone steps over it, boom, in a calm, respectful way that people listen to. Exactly. I laid down a boundary in that toilet yes. and he didn't cross it. Yeah. And it's just amazing. in general in your life to lay down boundaries and have people respect you. Yes. That is, that is a beautiful thing and it is a great freedom. And all I'm really doing is helping you reconnect to yourself because that's yes. the first thing we disconnect from i used to look in the mirror and i didn't know who was looking back yeah i can Who's imagine that? that right i don't know who that is and that's yeah. awful and so i can't help myself if i can't even connect with myself or listen to what i'm trying to do tell myself to help myself yeah. right so really it's just about accepting it had nothing to do with you there's nothing you could have done 
acknowledging, hey, there are some resources that I can use in the future. Exactly. Right? That I'm so awesome that I'm still here walking this planet, taking the next yeah. breath, and that, and that I am so courageous and strong that yeah. I can build those resources. Because look what I've lived through. I mean, if you can live through that, building a few resources is easy. Exactly. Right? I agree. I totally agree, yes. Really. I have the utmost respect for people who have lived through what they've lived through because I know. Yeah. And, yeah, I just, oh, I'm crying, sorry, because I do. I am really proud of my tribe. Yeah. Yes. And here's the thing. In your streets, hey, you've got a street and there's, there's 25 houses in your street. You will not be alone. But you don't know that because we don't talk about it. I know. Yeah. And we can be so supportive of each other, but we don't yes. know how. So first of all, we have to be supportive of ourselves. I, I can yes. see people like in, in toilets or just standing somewhere sometimes, and I know that they're, they're having a trigger. And I'll just go over and I'll just say, hi, how are you? I know what's happening. Would you like a cup of tea? Hmm. You know, I'm here until you feel that you, you're okay. Yeah. And and they say they thank me because just me acknowledging yes. that made all the difference. Now you don't have to do that. You don't. That's okay, right? But you can do that for yourself. Yes. To say, exactly. hey, like I'm said. so incredible. Let's let me. I'll build some resources. I can have some boundaries, and I can reconnect with myself. And because it, what it is that has traumatized me, is nothing to do with me. I I can love myself. I don't have to blame yeah, myself beautiful. anymore, mm -hmm. and I don't have to yeah. blame anyone else because that's their issues, and they're responsible for them. And by blaming them, I'm taking their issues on. No. They're their issues. Yeah, give them back. Yeah, yeah. Give them back. Right? <laughs> no exactly. more. That's no, no, no. That's, You're yeah, only responsible no for your own self. And you can gift yourself. Yes. The resources. Yeah. That's empowering. That's very, yeah. yes. Yeah. That, that are going to give you a much more peaceful, connected, safe life. Yeah. Where you're happy. Yeah, that's what I would say, yeah. That's beautiful, Michelle. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing your story. Like I said, you know, not everybody needs to share their story, no, no. you know, or publicly online, but I think, it's, no. you know, we learn so much from other people's story. And, yeah. you know, if we can help with this podcast to get one person to get it out of their chest and for the first time speak, you know, about their uh, experience and journey with somebody you know we have already made a, well, they don't even have to and... speak about it it's to just acknowledge it and like i said there's different types of therapy some you've got to talk about it I, i've mm. had people who have rung me and and said you know i've been assaulted and, and okay, okay well you don't have to say any more yeah. And we go from there. Right? Mm. And and then they get to a point where they can they can be in control of that thing that has traumatized and, and terrified them. And then they can also lay down boundaries so that they feel that, that, that safe in that, you know, that's not going to happen again. Mm. Or if yeah. it does, that they can actually deal with it, like I did. Calmly, concisely. Yes. And have the responsibility in the right places and be at peace with that. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's beautiful. So I will add all your links so people can get your yeah. um, book and get in touch with or you. Or ring me. Uh, you're doing an amazing ring me work. Or email yes. me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and thank you so much again for being here. And, and I'm sure I will catch up with you very soon. Thank you, Angelica, for having me on. And thank you for everyone for, for, for tuning in and, um, and being there, this gift you've given yourself.
big hugs. Beautiful. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.